So hi, everyone. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Melissa Langston. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in this afternoon for our first faculty seminar of the summer. Um, if you haven't already done so, remember to put yourself on mute. If you do have questions during the presentation, um, you can either put them in the chat log or save them for at the end and we can have a question and answer session. But right now I'll introduce our speaker for today who is uh, Dr. Jason Downs from the biology department. And his talk is the paleontological research introduces new species into late Devonian terrestrial ecosystems. So sit back, relax. And Jason, it's all Thank you. you. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Melissa, for giving me this opportunity and giving all of us an opportunity to share uh, the things that we think about, the things that we work on uh, with all of you. And thanks to all of you for, for showing up. Um, I'm going to switch over to my slides here and get started. And one thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention. Um, okay. Uh, Melissa suggested that you can add questions to the chat and, and certainly feel free to do that. But because I have my slides full screen, I won't be able to watch that chat window. So I won't get to the questions until the end, but feel free to add them uh, as we move along uh, or ask them at the end. Um, so I, uh, when, when you all don't see me on campus, I am often uh, uh, at the Academy of Natural Sciences Museum in Philadelphia. And I've been associated with the vertebrate paleontology department there since I was 15 years old. Um, I was a volunteer in high school and, and I've stuck around the place, um, not just because um, I love Philadelphia and I love living in Philadelphia, uh, and not only because there is just a wonderful um, uh, group of people to work with there, but it's also a collection that I've been contributing to for this last uh, 26 years, 27 years now. Uh, and, it's, and it's one that would be really hard to separate myself from because it is, uh, I think, uh, the best in the world uh, with which to do the kind of research that, that I want to do. And what I study are uh, late Devonian terrestrial ecosystems. The late Devonian, um, uh, at least according to the rocks that I study, lasts from about 375 to 360 million years ago. So in, in order to get started here, I want to just kind of establish the setting and put us in that place and give you some sense of what the world looks like at that time. Uh, and then also what, what um, Pennsylvania looks like at that time, because Pennsylvania is going to be one of the focuses of this talk. So uh, this is what Earth looks like today. And what I'll do now is sort of click through time and we're moving backwards in time to give you a sense of what the planet looks like at different points in time. Uh, so this is 20 million years ago. And we'll pause here. This is 65 million years ago. Uh, this is a time in Earth history, paleontological history, that gets a lot of attention because this is the time at which um, uh, most of the dinosaurs go extinct. A lot of large-bodied reptiles go extinct at this time. Uh, not all of the dinosaurs went extinct, right? We have plenty of birds today. Um, but you can see that the Earth is recognizable at this time. The Atlantic Ocean is a little bit more narrow, and a lot of the continents are flooded. So you notice a lot of those flooded sort of apiric continental seas. Uh, but we need to go back much further to get to the Devonian period. It's at about this time that dinosaurs show up for the first time. So the origin of dinosaurs is around 250 million years ago. And this is the time of Pangaea. You've probably heard that term. That's when the land masses um, are united into this sort of enormous continent. Uh, and that's, that's about the time dinosaurs get started. But we've got to go back even further still um, to a point before the formation of Pangaea. And this is what Earth looks like uh, in the late Devonian period. Uh, a few things, can you see my um, cursor here? Okay, so um, a few things to, to note here. This is the, the eventual North American landmass here. It's a continent called uh, Laurentia. Um, and then you have Siberia up here, you have um, the Baltics over here, Baltica, and then this is Gondwana land down here. So there's, so there's this basic separation between North and South. And when you work in the paleontology, work on the paleontology of the Devonian period, you really recognize that because the southern fauna is very different from the northern fauna. 
Now, if you weren't sort of following that path or kind of forget where we started, I just put an arrow in here to show you this is where Pennsylvania is in the late Devonian period. And one of the things that you can notice is that it is Southern hemisphere and also very close to the equator. So the, the kinds of climate that we would expect in any given position on planet Earth are very different now than they were at, uh, at this time period that we're talking about the late Devonian. So this is about 370 million years ago. Here's how I want to organize the talk. I, I, there's a lot of different ways that I could go with this. I could talk about my most recent project and really dig in, or I could kind of give a survey of projects that uh, I've worked on uh, over the last few years. And so I took that strategy. I, I want to talk about a number of different projects, touch upon them, tell some fun stories, give you a sense of the work I do, what field work is like, uh, what, the, what the lab work is like. And so I'm splitting it here into these two geographic areas. These are the areas that I've been most active in the field and also in terms of the focus of, of the, um, the, the, the work, the, the publications that have come out of this. Um, I'll start by talking about the Catskill Formation of Pennsylvania. And that I'm labeling road cut paleontology because when you work in Pennsylvania, you're working on road cut cliffs more often than not. Uh, and I want to talk about these two this, this, this one group here, but these two particular species, the group is Tristichoteridae, and that's a group of stem tetrapods. These are, uh, when I say that, what I mean is that these are lobe-finned vertebrates that belong to the lineage uh, within which we will have the origin of limbs, the origin of fingers and toes. So these tristichoterids are finned members of that lineage, more primitive than the limbed members. But if we're curious about why even you and I walk on land and have fingers and toes and have limbs and not fins, the answer to those questions is in this lineage, Sarcoterygii, and so we're looking at finned members of that lineage. Uh, so two species from Pennsylvania, Hyneria lindae and Langleria radiatus. Then we'll move up to the High Arctic, which is another place that I've been active, and we'll talk about the rock formation there. It's called the Fram Formation. Uh, another tristichoterid dimension there, you spend a tear on Jenkins' eye. And then I'm going to talk about uh, these armored aquatic vertebrates from the same time, from the same rocks, but a very different group than the tristichoterids. This is not lobe-finned vertebrates. This is a completely separate group, entirely extinct, that had interesting armored bodies. So I think they make for um, sort of fun visuals uh, in a talk like this. Here's what Pennsylvania looks like in uh, the late Devonian. Uh, so here we're zooming on in now. We kind of took a look at the planet in the late Devonian, but Pennsylvania uh, looks like this, and it should surprise you. I hope you can see the outline of Pennsylvania on there, Ohio to the west, Maryland to the south, New York to the north. Um, I, I expect that it surprises you that uh, all of western Pennsylvania is underwater. And that's not even fresh water, that's ocean. So this is a time when the oceans are higher, a lot of the continent is flooded, and we have these continental seas, these so-called epiric continental seas that are ocean on top of continental crust. And, you know, get used to images like this because with global warming and the seas coming up, we're going to see much more of this uh, in the years to come. But, but back in the late Devonian, western Pennsylvania is underwater, under ocean, and we have a mountain building event happening in the east. And so those are the mountains that you see off to the east. This is the Acadian uh, mountain orogeny, the Acadian or orogenic event. It's a result of a collision that's happening on the east coast. Um, this sort of continental terrain called um, Avalonia is, is colliding with East Coast North America. Mountains are rising up as a result of that collision. As mountains rise up, they're continually weathering and those sediments are eroding away. And so the sediments that are eroding westward into this Epiric Sea, those are being deposited and are becoming cemented together and forming the sedimentary rocks that we study today in order to access these uh, really interesting late Devonian terrestrial vertebrates. So that's the context of the time. The rocks that we're studying are, are, or the fossils that we're studying were buried in these sediments that were shed off the Acadian mountains 
in the east shed westward into this uh, up here at sea. If you think about Pennsylvania today and Pocono Mountains and, and Appalachian Mountains, those are younger mountains. Those are, that's, that's a result of the Alleghenian orogeny, which would happen after the end of the Acadian orogeny. And that's a result, the Alleghenian orogeny, of Africa colliding with the east coast of, of North America. So it's not, kind of a fun uh, bit of geological history there. Um, when you work in Pennsylvania, or when you do uh, paleontological work in Pennsylvania, like I say, so much of this is happening on uh, roadsides, on what we call road cuts. This is where PennDOT blasts through mountains in order to build roads. Uh, and the reason why we're walking these cliffs is uh, because they are these uh, oases of exposed rock. Pennsylvania is a place with a lot of people, a lot of civilization, and also a lot of vegetation. And civilization and vegetation cover rocks. So you gotta go to places where the rocks are exposed. Uh, there are some, some limited opportunities to do river cut type uh, uh, prospecting, but, but the biggest rocks exposures in Pennsylvania are these road cuts. Um, that's uh, Kate Criswell there who was um, and uh, an undergraduate at Shippensburg uh, College um, back when I did some work with her a few years ago. Uh, the most impressive uh, late Devonian field locality in Pennsylvania is one of these road cuts. It's along uh, uh, Pennsylvania Highway 120 in Clinton County, Pennsylvania. Uh, it, it's been given this name Red Hill for obvious uh, reasons due to the deep red color of the uh, siltstones and sandstones there. Uh, the redness is is the same redness of rust. It's it's iron oxides. Um, but this is not just a, a famous field locality for the Late Devonian of Pennsylvania. This is one of the most famous Late Devonian field localities anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, this is well known in in Europe and Australia and and everywhere. People are uh, asking questions about these. Uh, these vertebrates, these invertebrates, these plants, um, Red Hill is part of that conversation. And it's not only because so many fossils have come from Red Hill, but uh, such a, an impressive variety of, of uh, uh, diversity of, of uh, life has come out of this hill. So just to show you some of that, it's not just vertebrates. There are plants here. That's an uh, early vascular plant. I think it's a species of Varinophyton there from Red Hill. All of these on this slide will be. That's the, a, a stem. You're sort of seeing it horizontally here. I hope you can tell these little spots on there are leaf scars. This is a stem of a, of a, a, a lycopsid type plant. This, this should have the appearance of fern fronds. And this is what we would refer to as a, as a tree fern or a progymnus fern. Uh, this is um, Archaeopteris, not Archaeopteryx, the, the um, dinosaur, but Archaeopteris with an S. Uh, the, the tree fern. There's also um, invertebrates from Red Hill, including invertebrate trace fossils. What you're seeing here is a part counterpart fossil uh, with a body and a limb trace along it. So right along here, if you see that linear feature, that's a body trace of some arthropod from the Devonian walking over this muddy surface. And the little spots on either side of it are where the where its feet fell as it walked. So just sort of impressive uh, preservation uh, suggesting something about you know lifestyle of an organism from this time. Invertebrate body fossils like this uh, trigonotarbid which is an arachnid relative and then vertebrates and vertebrates are what I spend my time studying um, whole body fossils like this um, this little ray finned fish um, Limnomus delanii uh, and then partial fossils of much bigger vertebrates, like some of those that I'll talk about today. This is um, a skull on the left and part of the scale jacket of a, of a, a new species in the group Megalichthys, which I um, just finished working on and, and got accepted uh, for publication um, while this stay at home order has been going on actually. So let's talk about some of these projects that have come out of Pennsylvania in the last few years. Uh, this first one here, new description and diagnosis of Hyneria linde from the Upper Devonian Catskill Formation in Pennsylvania. This is, this is focusing on one of these tristichoterids, one of these lobe-thin vertebrates. Uh, the name here, Hyneria linde, is not one that, that 
I and my co-authors have devised. It's an, it's an old name. It was originally described back in 1968. It's named for Heiner, Pennsylvania. That's where Heineria comes from. Uh, Linde is named after the original researcher's wife. Her name was Linda. Uh, the original uh, researcher with Keith was Keith Thompson. Keith had uh, very limited material to work with back in the 1960s. And so in the decades that we've been collecting um, at Red Hill, Heineria is from Red Hill, we've filled cabinets up with this animal. So we had this opportunity to go back to an animal that was described uh, over 50 years ago from limited material and really, really blow it wide open, offer a brand new kind of full description of the anatomy, and then also help to make sense of what this name really refers to now that we have a much better understanding of the animal. And the relevance of Hyneria is that it is inferred to be the top predator uh, at this Red Hill Field locality. It's an, it's an enormous animal, probably uh, in life would have been something like three meters long, and living in relatively shallow stream channels in this sort of uh, this deltaic plain uh, that we mentioned a few slides back. Here's some of that material um, that actually this is this is about the entirety of the material minus some scales that was available to Keith Thompson back in 1968. And if it has this appearance of, you know, just like a jumble, like roadkill, that's because that's, that's really what he had to work with. And a lot of the, 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 the mistakes, the misidentifications, the problematic aspects of his diagnosis are no fault of his. It really comes down to it being a fault of the material. Uh, and we were able to uh, build upon the work that he did, but only because we had so much more material available. So this is just kind of highlighting some of the issues with that original um, uh, publication. For one example, he identified a dermopalatine as a vomer. He, he identified a vomer as a prearticular. So getting a few of the bone identifications wrong, um, which wouldn't be too much of a problem except for one aspect of his diagnosis of the species. And when I say diagnosis, I mean, what are those features that we can look for in order to recognize material as belonging to a particular species, right? So these, these features that you list in your diagnosis matter because that's what everybody else is going to go out and say, hey, okay, I found that feature. I must be working with this species. Um, so based on the, the, the misidentifications of the vomer element specifically, one of the things that Thompson listed in his diagnosis was um, that the vomers of Hyneria lindae lack an extensive posterior flange. But again, that was based on misidentifications. What we know now is that the vomer has an especially long posterior flange or caudal process. So it's, it's the complete opposite of what is listed in the original diagnosis. This sets us up for, you know, or this provides a real need for us to not only describe the new bits of the anatomy we have, but go back and improve the diagnosis for the species. Uh, okay, so let's see, he, um, Sorry, some of my Zoom window stuff is getting in the way. Okay, um, so he diagnosed Hyneria linde with uh, dermal elements that lack an enamel layer, an ornament of coarse uh, anastomosing dentin ridges, isolated tubercles in the ornament absent, clithrum ornamented with uh, anastomosing ridges running parallel to the long axis of the bone. It's not important to understand all of that um, kind of anatomical language there. The point that I want to make by, by um, kind of presenting it here is that um, each of the, these features that he's describing, uh, as, as each of those that I just mentioned, are also present in many other places across sarcopterygii. So they're, they're bad diagnostic features if they aren't unique to the species you want them to be unique to. So th those also need to be removed from a diagnosis. Um, there's also a problem with relative language here, and this, this plagues a lot of, of species diagnoses in and out of paleontology if you go back 50 plus years. So using language in a diagnosis like the lower jaw is relatively elongate and shallow, or the gulars are narrow and gently curved, or the teeth are stout with deeply furrowed base, or the clavicle has a stout asc ascending process. Each of these terms like elongate, shallow, narrow, gently, stout, 
deeply. Each of these is open for interpretation. And that's also language you don't really want in the diagnosis because my relatively elongate might be very different from your relatively elongate or Keith's relatively elongate. So what we wanted to do was re-diagnose the animal using features that are discrete and reproducible. Whoops. Um, and Thompson also used some proportional features in his diagnosis that are certainly true of the material that he had available, but now that we have so much more of the animal are no longer true of the species. So for example, he wrote that the length of the postparietal shield is contained approximately four and a half times in the length of the lower jaw. And that is true of that one specimen, that one skull that he had to work with, but based on all the material we have now, it is not true of all of them. So we needed to strip out also those kinds of proportional features that were true of Thompson's material, but not true of the entire collection uh, as, we, as we now see. All the work that Thompson did uh, resulted in this, this sort of, um, this reconstruction, this kind of popular concept of what Hyneria lindae looked like, and that's the animal front and center in this painting that was commissioned for National Geographic magazine. Uh, that was back in May 1999, and what was fun about that feature in National Geographic is that the feature was on Red Hill in Pennsylvania specifically, and this painting then is representing everything that had been found at Red Hill to that time. So it really is this great artist's conception of this field locality um, that I've become so familiar with. Um, but that's Hyneria Linde right there front and center. Uh, I want to show a video also that is uh, based on the interpretations that came out of um, Keith's work. Okay, so are you seeing this video? You can just nod. Okay. Uh, so this is now Walking with Mon Monsters, which was a BBC production, um, which was a follow-up to Walking with Dinosaurs, but it uses CG animation to imagine uh, some of these animals. And the fun thing about Walking with Monsters is that they touched upon the Devonian period, which doesn't get much attention uh, in, in sort of, you know, pop culture. Uh, but have a look at this video. These aren't Hyneria that you're looking at now. Those are a limbed vertebrate from Red Hill called Hynerpeton bassidae. Oh, yeah. there's, a, there's, there's a pair of them there, and they are, you know, enjoying each other's company, it seems. But Hyneria will come out of the water behind them. Just like Jaws here. So pretty, pretty silly stuff. I mean, the, you know, the, the behavior there, the coming out of the water, the, the mobility of its fins required for it to kind of chase down that Hynerpeton and capture it, all of it is just, is just fantasy. But it's kind of fun to, to you know, see, uh, you know, the BBC thinking about Pennsylvania animals. And with the work that we did, with all the new collecting that we did, we were able to kind of change the popular conception of this animal. Um, so here's the, the new reconstruction of Hyneria Linde that's based on the work that, that we did. And this is an oil painting by Jason Poole uh, that accompanied the, the press materials for the paper, which came out in 2018. Uh, and so just to highlight some of the differences here um, between Keith's uh, uh, study of Hyneria and what we now uh, recognized to be much more likely to be the shape of the animal based on all the new uh, fossils. 
It has a much wider and flatter skull, I hope you recognize, based on what we were relative to what we've seen, which had a, which had a very sort of torpedo type shape to it. The eyes are very small. It doesn't have those big eyes on the front of its body uh, like those old reconstructions did. The eyes are small and they're also more laterally positioned. It has a very deep caudal fin. It has a deep anal fin. And both of these would have made for incredibly awkward ground walking. So beyond the fact that its pectoral fin, fin certainly didn't have the mobility that we saw in the video, this is an animal that is well equipped to aquaticism and not at all to terrestriality. So, so we should disconnect ourselves from, from thinking that. Body size is large. It may be the largest known in the group, Tristichoteridae. Like I said, the, the biggest individuals may have been around three meters long. Um, and there are aspects of its skull and tooth row that suggest that this is a highly nested member of Tristichoteridae. This work sort of led into another project that I worked on with a few Belgian colleagues, uh, Sebastian Olive and Jan Leroy, and we did a phylogenetic analysis of the group to look at the relationships among Tristichoteridae, and with all the new anatomical information that we were able to contribute, we sort of have this new understanding that Hyneria is a highly derived, or what you can think of as sort of like an advanced uh, Tristichoterid. Uh, some of the things um, to note about the anatomy, uh, one of them is a feature that's included in both the new diagnosis for Hyneria lindae and the old, and that is a very particular scale type. Uh, what you see at the top of each of these scale photos is what looks like a fringe or sort of a lacy type appearance here, you know, up here, kind of fringe-like, here more lacy-like. This is the free margin of the scale. It's the part of the scale that isn't overlapped. Um, and it's unusual in that it has this sort of perforated or, or fringe-like margin on it. Uh, it's the only tristichoterid with that type of scale. So it's a good, you know, singular, discrete, recognizable, reproducible feature uh, that can be used to recognize Hyneria material from, from non-Hyneria material. One of the new contributions to the anatomical understanding uh, is um, uh, this, this sort of new view of an internal system of sensory tubules, which is inside these kind of relatively flat, platy skeletal elements. The dermal skull, uh, the scales themselves are densely perforated with tubes. Uh, that's especially obvious, I think, here in the top left, this is a, an acid etched specimen. The back end of the skull, we acid prepared it to look at what's inside and what you're seeing are the sediment filled channels, canals that were inside that part of the skull roof. Um, and we, we presume this to be very similar to the lateral line type system that we see in aquatic vertebrates today, where what we have inside these tubes of water in the skeleton uh, are um, uh, 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 sensory receptors that can detect the flow of water around the animal. So here's an animal that we know to be living in these sort of shallow streams, vegetation choked, murky freshwater settings, uh, and all of this internal sensory systems in its skeleton may suggest that it's relying on this, this type of sensing of its environment uh, in addition to, or sometimes in place of its vision, remember those very tiny eyes, uh, so this gives it sort of a sixth sense ability to uh, detect the en environment around it. And it's, and it is, um, it, it is, it is complicated and it is uh, different in different parts of the skeleton, but, but just kind of highlight it here. It's a really impressive part of this animal. And then the new material also contributes some new anatomy to our understanding of Hyneria. What you see on the left is the caudal fin. So, uh, this is the part that would attach to the, the rest of the body here, and you can see some of these bigger radial elements here, but then you can see that all of this kind of stretching out, this is the, the, the caudal end, the back end, the tail end of the fin. So that's the big tail fin. This is the shoulder, um, not only the blade, which is called the clythrum in these animals, but also the, the big blocky scapula coracoid. This is the part down here that would be the homologue of our shoulder. Um, but again, just new material uh, uh, representing new parts of the anatomy of this animal. And, and the description that we provide in that, in that paper 
um, not only changes the diagnosis, changes the popular perception, but does a, uh, hopefully a good job of describing a lot of new anatomy. Okay, so that's that's one species down. I think I wanted to talk about like five or six, and we've already been through a half an hour. Um, so I'll, I'll end this at 45. I don't know how deep we'll get into it, but um, I'll find a good stopping point. So here's another animal from Pennsylvania. This was a this was a fun project. Um, this came out um, 2019, I believe. Uh, and 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 this is another collaboration. I should have mentioned the first paper was a collaboration with Ted Deschler, curator of vertebrate paleontology um, at the Academy. This here again collaborating with Ted and Chelsea Matsko, who was a Swarthmore College undergraduate when she worked on this with us. Our objective here was to solve a 130-year-old taxonomic mystery. There was an animal that that John Newberry discovered in the Catskill Formation of Pennsylvania. Devonian age, uh, lobe-finned vertebrate, and described it back in 1889. He named it Holotychius question mark radiatus, and he gave it that name because the scales that are associated with this material looked a whole lot like Holotychius scales. That scale type, though, no longer diagnoses Holotychius, so the diagnosis for Holotychius question mark radiatus needed some new attention because the scales alone are not enough to assign it to this group. Now it may, uh, when we started to think about this, it may still be a Holotychius, but we made a discovery uh, that pulls it out of the group Holotychius and actually pulls it out of the entire clade to which it belongs, or to which Holotychians belong, uh, poor lipoforms. So here in the bottom left, you see the scale type. That's actually reproduced from that original Newberry 1889 publication. Um, and it was that scale that, that, that Newberry used to assign it to group Holotychius. Holotychius is not a tristichoterid. It is a poroliporm, which is a lungfish relative. It's another lobe-thin vertebrate, but, but pretty distant from the tristichoteridae. And Newberry was uncertain about this assignment, hence the question mark that he put right there in the species name. Like the official species name is Holotychius question mark radiatus. Uh, but that publication also includes this line here, this question, the question of the question mark, will doubtless be solved by future discovery. So, you know, kind of fun to recognize that, that, that I was part of that future discovery that would finally, that would finally answer this question that, that Newberry had back in the 19th century. So it turns out with, with the new material that we've collected of um, what was once Holotychius question mark radiatus, we recognize that this is a tristichoterid. It's not a poroliporm. It's not a lungfish relative. It belongs in the group we've been talking about here, tristichoteridae. So we've pulled it out of uh, poroliporms, put it into tristichoteridae, and also assigned it to an existing group of um, tristichoterids called Langleria, which was previously only known from the Baltic region. So this becomes the first North American species of Langleria. And what you're seeing on the left or on the right there uh, are these sort of large boulders. You can get a sense from the scale there, five centimeters, uh, that these are big boulders that one person can't even move, but we have these in the lab and they are covered with skull material of this animal. Here's a, another specimen that's looking at the lower jaws. You're looking straight down onto the top of the lower jaws where they meet. So this is left lower jaw here meeting the right lower jaw on this side. These are elements between the lower jaws in the sort of ventral region, uh, goulers and submandibulars. But like I say, this is the first North American Langleria and it, and it helps to support this, this, um, this, this connection between North America and East Coast and also the Baltic region, it's supported not only by Langleria radiatus, but nearly everything else we do in Pennsylvania really highlights the similarities between the vertebrate fauna here and there. And it just speaks to the geographical proximity back in the late Devonian period. Uh, another thing that we're, we're realizing the more of these tristichoterids we work on here in Pennsylvania is that each site that we that we work in at the of the Catskill Formation has a single tristichoterid species, never more than one, 
and always a different one. So it, 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 it really speaks to this idea that the Tristicotarids were, for, were fulfilling this, this niche of the, the top predator in each of these uh, ecosystems. So now let's abandon Pennsylvania and switch over to the Canadian Arctic and talk a little bit about the animals uh, that we're finding up there. Um, the way our work in Pennsylvania got extended to the Canadian article to the Canadian Arctic actually comes back to this particular figure in this particular textbook, uh, the Dot and Bat textbook, Evolution of the Earth. This figure um, shows three regions in North America that expose late Devonian terrestrial sedimentary rocks. And when we're making decisions about where in the world to go, we start with a set of questions and then we need to say, okay, well, those questions require rocks and fossils at the surface from a certain time period and of a certain type. So we use geological maps like this in order to figure out where to go. And the, the three areas that are highlighted in pink here are the three areas where late Devonian terrestrial sedimentary rocks are exposed at the surface in North America. So this is the ongoing Catskill work here. You can see it even says Catskill red beds right there in the textbook. Here's another spot up in East Greenland um, where there are great late Devonian terrestrial rocks with vertebrate fossils, but um, there's a lot of study focused on that area, especially coming from, from European paleontologists. And then there was this spot here in the Canadian Arctic that was relatively unexplored, or at least had been unexplored by a paleontologist for the last hundred years. And that's what convinced us to, to make, our moves, make our move up into this area. In order to access um, the rocks of interest, we take these, these twin propeller planes that can land on sort of flat areas of the tundra. Uh, we can't get deep into some of these valleys that we intend to work, so we land on these tundra landing strips and then helicopters pick us up and deposit us uh, deep into these valleys. I want to com compare the um, the transportation that we used to the transportation that was used on the previous paleontological expedition uh, to, to um, th these, these Canadian islands. Um, and the last time a paleontologist collected, or a geologist, I should say, collected fossils in the, on these islands that we were, we were visiting uh, was uh, on a Norwegian expedition, which lasted from 1898 to 1902. And the way that they reached this area was on a ship called the Fram, which actually still is um, uh, still exists and is tourable uh, in Norway today because this was an, a really important ship in terms of Norwegian uh, polar exploration. But there's there's um, how the, the the previous expedition reached the islands that we flew into with our twin props and uh, helicopters. And here's the crew of the the Fram expedition. And again, I think it, it sets up a fun sort of point of comparison, just to point out a few of the, the characters here. And there are some sad stories. I mean, it was, it was difficult to do this kind of work 100 years ago. It's as difficult as it is today. It was much more so then. Um, the person I'm pointing out here is Johan, Johan Svensson. He was the, the team doctor. And, um, and in, I think they arrived around August of 1898. And in June of 1899, uh, Johann Svensson um, committed suicide, and and it's it's a really sad story, uh, and and it, it's one that that all is made more sad that he was the only one that wasn't sort of examined by a doctor before the expedition took place, and I think that there were a lot of psychological issues there that might have been recognized uh, had that type of um, uh, uh, checkup took place, but but he um, like I say uh, didn't last a single year, committed suicide. Um, Ove Braskarud, who was a stoker on the ship, he also died in that second year, 1899, in October, uh, and died of pneumonia. And, and so from, from that first summer on, and this was a four-year expedition, they didn't have any doctor with them. So I think that, you know, the, that only one more of them died as a result of no medical attention, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we could be surprised by that. 
Um, and here I'm, I'm focusing on Per Shai. He was the geologist on this trip. And this really was a scientific expedition. It was the second Fram expedition. The first one was just sort of an exploration, trying to reach the North Pole type expedition. This one was about documenting the rocks, the, the, the flora, the fauna, the fossils. And Per Shai was doing that, that work on the rocks and fossils. Um, he lost three toes uh, on this expedition. They had to be uh, amputated due to frostbite. But the, the, the fossils that he collected continue to be relevant today. Here's what we look like when we go up. Um, the technology of our gear is just very different than it was, you know, 100 plus years ago. I don't know why they, they choose to wear, you know, three-piece suits with ties and such in the field, but, um, but we stay pretty comfortable. A lot of smiles on the faces. You can, I, I look pretty grouchy there for some reason, but, but a lot of smiles in that group. Uh, and like I say, those, those fossils that were collected back uh, on that second Fram expedition are still relevant. And some of the work that we're doing is going back and looking at those fossils and, and, and re-describing them and re-diagnosing them based on the, the collections that, that we're making. So these are all uh, figures from a 1915 publication by Johann Kier, but they're all fossils that were collected by Per Shai. And uh, the Canadian Arctic, Arctic is just a great place to do geology and paleontology. I mean, compare this image to that one of Pennsylvania where you've got roads and cars driving by and trees and plants getting in the way. Uh, none of that uh, on, on this island here. This is Ellesmere Island. And I think this is a fun photo in that you don't even see sky, right? It's just rock everywhere you see. It's wonderful. And it's also um, a great place to, to do field work because the sun doesn't set in the summer. So we go up for six weeks and the sun just circles overhead. So you can, you can get lots of hours in on the rocks or you know, sit up at night reading. This is probably close to 10 o'clock at night or so, maybe even later. Uh, and that's me outside my tent there doing some late night reading. Um, uh, in, in 2000, uh, we uh, discovered a really important field locality that has been productive in, in all the years since. Um, and and uh, with the exception of the most recent handful of years, every few years we've had a team going out to collect more from this one uh, field locality, the 2K, the NV2K17 locality, which just stands for Nunavut, which is the territory 2K for the year 2000 when it was discovered, and 17 for the 17th site discovered that year. That's where it is, you know, and, and this is a great sort of, you know, shallow U-shaped glacial valley here that we're working in. Uh, here's a photo right before the discovery of the site, kind of looking down that nose, but right down that, that hill is where we would start to find fossils. And so from 2000, fossils have been spilling out of this hill. First, just uh, kind of picking them up off the surface, like that handful of lungfish tooth plates that you see in the bottom left. Uh, and each time we've gone back, we've digged deeper into this, this hillside in order to expose just an enormous platform of fossils. Um, so that was 2002 here, kind of digging into the hill. You see we've got a big platform upon which many people can, can work and collect. Again, in 2006, you can see that the, the back wall is getting higher and higher in each of these photos. Uh, and there's an image from, from 2008, one of the more recent expeditions, but you can see just how much space there is now on that, on that platform and how many people you can have working simultaneously on one productive surface. Another image from above there. This is the site that produced um, this, this relatively famous, I mean, as famous as fossils can get, um, uh, vertebrate that's in the fin to limb transition. This is the finned vertebrate more closely related to limbed vertebrates than any other previously discovered. And, and it's an animal that, that our research group named Tiktaalik rosae. It's from that 17 locality. Um, and, and I'm not focusing on, on it now, but, but it's, it's a great animal that I, you know, could certainly talk about at some other time. Okay, so uh, in the last few minutes, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll just kind of um, wrap things up here with the Tristichoteridae. Kind of we've talked about Pennsylvania Tristichoterids. Now we'll talk about um, one of these Arctic uh, Tristichoterids. And then we'll, we'll leave off the, the uh, armored aquatic vertebrates for another time. Uh, this is a, a paper that um, we put out uh, a couple years ago now. Um, Eustenoteron Jenkins' eye 
new species of tristicoterid from the Upper Devonian of Nunavut, Canada, and a review of Eusthenoteron taxonomy. So we described new material, belongs to a new species of Eusthenoteron. This is another tristicoterid. But what we wanted to do with this project was really develop a proper diagnosis of this very relevant group, Eusthenoteron. Eusthenoteron was um, one of the very first tristicoterids to be discovered and described. It's also known from hundreds of specimens and so has become sort of the model tristicoterid. And yet, if you kind of fast forward to today, nobody can really tell you what Eusthenoteron is. There is no good diagnosis for the group. And so when we started this project on, on a new Eusthenoteron, we knew that it had the, the look of Eusthenoteron, but we didn't even know how to say that it was a Eusthenoteron because there was no good way of recognizing species in this group. So one of the things that we had to do if we wanted to describe a new Eusthenoteron is provide some way of recognizing Eusthenoterons from this point forward. So we wrote a new diagnosis. And I'm going to skip a couple of things here uh, just to kind of talk about that aspect of the project. Here's our new diagnosis for Eusthenoteron. It's the combination of a new denary fang and two fang pairs on the third carinoid. The third carinoid is a bone of the lower jaw. The denary is a bone of the upper jaw. And among tristicoterids, Eusthenoteron is the, all those species are the only ones, with one exception I'll mention, uh, to show this combination. The denary has no fang. The third carinoid has two fang pairs. That's nice and discreet, recognizable, reproducible. It seemed good. Um, it's a combination because there wasn't any one feature that we could use as unique for Eusthenoteron. However, I mentioned that there was one, one exception, one problem. And I label that here as the Yarvikina problem. There is a Russian tristicoterid, Yarvikina wenjukawai, described by Amelia Vorobieva in 1977, that also shows that feature combination that we wanted to use for the revised diagnosis of Eusthenoteron. It has no denary fang, two fang pairs on the third carinoid. So what we did was we turned to the diagnosis for Yarvikina, and I've translated it from the Russian here on the right. Have a look at this list of features in the diagnosis. Contact between posterior superorbital and intertemporal. That sounds good, right? That's discrete, recognizable, reproducible. It either has a contact or it doesn't. Only problem is that Yarvikina is not the only tristicoterid to show that contact. There are several other groups of tristicoterids that show it. So that's not a good feature. All the others use relative language. Further back position of pineal complex, relatively short otic occipital, longer cheek, long maxilla, height of lacrimal, about the same, and so on and so on. So there was no feature here in the Yarvikina diagnosis that we, could, that we could hold on to. It was in the same place as Eusthenoteron, right? Eusthenoteron diagnosis problematic, Yarvikina diagnosis problematic. The one discrete feature is seen elsewhere and everything else uses this kind of mushy relative language. So what we did was take a look at Yarvikina, that material, kind of dug into where that came from and how it had been described not only in the 1977 publication, but in previous publications. And what we found was that the original description of that material named it Eusthenoteron Wenjukawai. The Vorobieva work was not a new description. She took a species out of Eusthenoteron and gave it a new name and built this pretty weak diagnosis around it. So this gave us an opportunity to simply reverse course, take it back from Yarvikina and put it into Eusthenoteron where it originally sat. And if we do that, if we say, hey, there's nothing in the Yarvikina diagnosis that works, Yarvikina is not real, this material belongs in Eusthenoteron, it is Eusthenoteron wenjikawai as it was originally described, now our diagnosis works for all the material that has been named Eusthenoteron. And what's fun about this is that this actually follows the example of Eric Yarvik himself, who, who is the namesake of Yarvikina. Vorobieva named it after him. But after that 1977 publication, Eric Yarvik himself continued to call it 
eusthenotera and wenjikawai. So that allows us to not feel too bad in dumping Rearvacina and putting it back in Eusthenoteron because the guy after which the, the, the material was named, he was doing the same thing after this publication as well. So I wanna, um, I'll stop there. Sorry to go a few minutes late. Um, and I'll just jump. I didn't think I'd get to everything. I had like 75 slides. <laughs> Um, I'll just jump ahead to the acknowledgements. And, and what I especially want to mention is that all the work that I've presented <clears throat> is a collaboration uh, with the people um, in the vertebrate paleontology department uh, at the Academy of Natural Sciences Museum. And that's Ted Deschler, Ned Gilmore, Fred Mullison, Kelly Rosenitas. Um, and and the, the, the manuscripts that I had the chance to uh, talk about uh, were co-authored by, um, by uh, at Ted, as I mentioned, but also Chelsea Matsko and uh, Neil Schubert. So I'll leave things off there and uh, we can turn things over to questions. No question. Yay, that was really good. Yeah, it was really good. Um, I do have a question though. So for like future researchers, what would your suggestion be to reconcile using those relative terms that are not translatable future researchers? Um, so, so, like, is the question, um, you know, how would I sort of, um, what recommendation might I make for these diagnoses that already exist, or in terms of like new diagnoses that could be written? Um, new that could be written, yeah, and you know, as far as the previous ones, I mean, there's only so much you can do, right? Yeah, and so it, it is a it is a, a really interesting question, a really interesting problem, and and when you work in the Paleozoic, which which is the the era you know that the Devonian period belongs in, which is prior to the Mesozoic era, prior to the Cenozoic era, the the fossil record is so fragmentary. People that work in the Cenozoic and Mesozoic sort of look at us and, and wonder why we even bother, right? I mean, but, that, but that's where I operate. And when you work on such fragmentary stuff, you're often in this position where when you want to describe new material, you, you have to do uh, the taxonomic detective work required before you do your assignments, before you do your diagnosing. Um, because, like I say, the material is so fragmentary, the community is so small. If 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 you you know want to describe a new Eusthenoteron, it may have been 20 years since anybody's even published uh, you know on Eusthenoteron, and the material that exists for the group is going to be fragmentary. So there's all these bad diagnoses that are out there. Um, so so I always I always think, and this is how I operate, and this is what I suggest is like your your first job is to do the taxonomic work like you, it's up to you now if you want to set a new sort of starting place for future work in this group you need to tell us what is eusthenoteron what is langleria what is hyneria and 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 i think that's so much fun you know i i love because like i say it's like it's like detective work it's 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 historical research rather than scientific research um but but I I'm I'm not the kind of paleontologist that will that that just says, you know, hey, it it, it kind of looks like this. I'll 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 put it in there and I'll just I'll just repeat the diagnosis that that was the most recent presented. I, I like fixing all that stuff before I get started. Any other questions? I do. I have a question, Jason. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, did they used to describe a uh, new species in Latin? Um, you mean like like the description diagnosis? Yeah, like a new species. You know, I guess in botany, used to new species were used to that were required to have a Latin description. Wow. Um, so it's something I did that. Yeah, it's something I've never encountered. And you know, and and the the kind of um, the detective work that 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 I've had to do takes me back to you know these 18th century sort of like original you know descriptions of material in these in these Devonian groups, and I, and I've and I've never seen it. So my guess is, 
you know, that, that, it, that it was never a requirement in, in our field. But that's really interesting to hear. Uh, you know, the, the, the closest I ever got to that was um, I, I just uh, uh, had a paper in a, a French uh, journal, uh, Geodiversitas, and I submitted it and they came back and they said, hey, you know, your, your abstract has to be written in French. And I was just like, oh man, you know what I mean? Like Google Scholar only, or Google Translate only gets you so far. So luckily I, I had a colleague that wrote that for me, but uh, yeah. It, it used to be the norm in, in, for describing new plant species. That's yeah. what I was asking. Thank That's you. That's really interesting. Yeah, sure. Good to see you. Do you ever feel like sometimes you're just looking at like a bunch of puzzle pieces mixed together? Like it's like impossible. You just want to throw in the towel. I feel like that's like when I look at these fossils, you're like, oh, you see like these little track marks. Like how do you yeah. know that that's a track mark? Like it looks like a plant stem. Like how do you tell? Yeah, you know, and it and it it comes with experience, Sam. And it's and it's 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 always. I mean, it's like interesting to hear you say that because. Like when I put together a talk like this, I'm like, I'm just going to put out the stuff there that's like the most recognizable. But I think even still, like as you're recognizing, it's like, even still, it's like, how do you know that's not a rock? You know, it's just like a lump of something. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it is, it is all about kind of like the, 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 the time you put in, the experience that you, you end up with. And, and I think what's interesting is that, um, if if you move to a new site, if you if you like if you start studying new rocks, you have to you have to like relearn all your search images because the way something is going to be preserved and the kind of the way the light reflects off of it and the colors and the, the textures, a lot of that is dictated by the depositional environment. So you go somewhere new, and I find this a lot when I start prospecting new areas, new rocks. Uh, the first few days you don't see anything and you just assume that there isn't anything and then you start to kind of clue into okay this is what these fossils look like here this is the kind of textures and shines and colors I'm looking for and then you start to see fossils where previously you didn't so it's something that you, you sort of have to relearn every time you end up in a new place and look at new rocks. Yeah, why? Well, because I always like, um, you know, like whenever I explain to anybody like how a paleontologist operates too, is I feel like, you know, you have a forensics degree, but it's <laughs> like your minor is either in biology or geology. That's exactly yeah. what you do. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and, and that's, that's the fun of it, right? I mean, like for me, is that, is that I, you know, I, I'm somebody who, majored in both biology and geology. You know, I think paleontology is really at that intersection. But but like you say, so much of so much of the work is you know, well not so much of it, but there but there are aspects of like historical research and and detective work and you know, pattern recognition and you know and uh you know and then and then the quantitative techniques that are required to kind of make some sense of some of the things that you're looking at. So it it's uh yeah, no, it's a it's a you know, it's a it's a really fun field to be in. There's no question about it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Hi, Cynthia. Right. So, do you have any? After you published your um, results and you reclassified the organisms, did you ever anybody come back and say, "No, I don't agree with you," or was it just totally accepted? I always feel like I ask yeah. because I, you're always reading. The newspaper journal articles where they talk about new fossil finds they'll always quote some other scientists saying they don't believe them or you yeah. know what I mean like yeah like a, you know wars going on be, in fossils I don't know so yeah. I'm just wondering. no uh, you're 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 right um, you know but 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 here's here's the other um, the other thing that's nice about working in the Paleozoic is um there's no real competition you know there's there, like the the community is so small and generally friendly that we don't run into a lot of that and a lot of the, a lot of us are are already in touch with one another so you know before i do something that i think might be 
you know, dramatic. I mean, it's like, how dramatic is it when you work on Paleozoic fossils? But it's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to people in the field and say like, hey, what do you, like, what do you think, the, does this make sense to you? Like, what do you think the reaction is going to be to this? And then, you know, and then of course, there's an opportunity to get some of that feedback, you know, in the review process as well. But um, you know, I, 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 when I submit things, I, you know, I'm buff. Like I say, I'm buffered by the fact that I work in the Paleozoic. Like if I worked on dinosaurs, you know, if I worked on mammals, it would be a completely different story. But I work on, you know, I'm working on Tristicotarids from the Devonian period. It, you know, there's just there's so few of us that care and and we're friendly. <laughs> but uh, but we're you know like and you know each of us has this goal of just making things better for everyone else like that that should be our goal in taxonomy you know it's not like it's not like i'm trying to get everyone to subscribe to jason downs's view of the universe it's like i i want this group to work for you you know i want it, i want your i want if you if you follow up on what i'm doing i want it to be easier than it was for me so so um yeah, I mean that's that's what motivates it, and and like I say, it's um, you're you're totally right, but I my guess is a lot of that is in the realm of dinosaurs and mammals. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So your advice to all the students is work on something that nobody really. <laughs> yeah. Them, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it and it just so happened. I mean, like I'm not a very I'm not a very like competitive person. So it, the, the Devonian period works great for me. It's, it, it completely matches my personality, but, but it's also a product of where I grew up. You know, it's, it's not like when I started in paleo, I thought, Hey, I can do anything. So why don't I go to a place where there are very few people working or where there's very little competition or I won't, I won't make many waves it's like I grew up in Pennsylvania and, you know, and the rocks here are producing great Devonian vertebrate fossils. So it's like, you know, that's, that's how I got connected to it. I bet if I grew up, you know, in like, you know, the Badlands or something like that, I'd, I would, you know, be studying Triceratops or whatever, you know, I have dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, but it is a good match from my personality for sure. Thanks, Cynthia. Any other questions? I have a question, Jason. Yes. Um, so thinking about the fringe scales and that sensory system, and then of yeah. course how the fossil record is in fact so fragmented, is there something that connects that, or species maybe that connects that sensory system to the lateral line that we're familiar with in species that we see today? Yeah, I, and and the, you know the best the best way to approach that kind of question in the uh, approach that, that 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 you know that that kind of thinking in 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 completely extinct groups is to you know try to try to you know bracket that extinct group with living groups and and we can do that for tristicoterids. So you know we have you know more more primitive down the vertebrate lineage we have things like ray finned fish that show you know lateral line systems and in um, you know, and in on the opposite side, you know, up in to limbed vertebrates, we have we have like salamanders doing this same sort of thing. So we've got we've got living vertebrates here doing it, living vertebrates here doing that. So when we see those those types of canals here between the two, you know, we've got a good basis for the inference that they're performing that function. We can never know for sure, but 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 yeah, at least for that particular bit of functional anatomy, we've got a good you know, basis of inference. Right. That's yeah. neat. That's more of that detective work, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Good bases of inference. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Sorry, just very quickly. I know that yes. you were talking about the um, Hyernia Linde. Yes. I said that they were like didn't really have the pectoral fins to be able to walk on land. So you would right. say it's like would be more of an advanced species in this sense because it was able to kind of throw itself out of the water and maybe attack some food on land. <laughs> uh, well, so um, that you know that that video shows um, the you know what would have to have been the humerus. I mean these you know these are lobe fin vertebrates that have a humerus and a radius and an ulna and a scapula, same things that we have in our shoulders. So very different from what we see in in like ray fin fish. Um, 
But what would have been required in that video is for the humorist to be able to do this, right? Like swing all the way forward. And when you look at the, 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 the glenoid socket, which is the part of the scapula into which the humerus fits, that glenoid socket faces directly tailward, caudal. So, so that fin was really sort of locked in this position, like pointed back toward the tail. And there would have been no opportunity, especially because the glenoid is faced like this, there would have been no opportunity for it to like get full, you know, forward because it would have been like running up right up against that socket. So, so the, the pectoral fins, you know, had perhaps the mobility to do a little bit of, you know, directional maneuvering underwater, but it, but they, they certainly were not a propulsive uh, bit of anatomy. It was using its tail to propel itself forward, you know, and possibly changing position a bit with pectoral fins. So, so that video would have required uh, skeletal anatomy that is that we know now to be completely not the case for that for that species. Yeah, yeah, and that that kind of mobility that would allow for that is something that we would we would have to go far up that lineage into into limbed vertebrates to find. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. I guess with no other questions we can wrap things up today so first thank you to jason so much uh, i think this is a great way to kick off our seminar series for the summer so <laughs> hopefully people can tune in again we have two next week um on tuesday with dr doug lindy and then on thursday with doctors jess mccall and brian lutz so look out for that, that information coming out and of course thank you again jason so of course. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and until we can see each other again, so everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we can see each other again soon. So. I did want to say one thing before oh, we go. Um, so my name is Autumn. As you can see, I'm an incoming transfer student, hopefully for the fall. Oh, great. Um, so Welcome, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going into the zoology uh, degree. So hopefully maybe down the line, I know you're a biology professor, maybe uh -huh. I'll, I'll have you. So I just wanted yes. to say this is very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, it's hard for me to think of questions because even <laughs> though I'm very interested in this and paleontology in general, um, even so, this is all still very out of my frame where I'm like, I kind of know what they're talking about, but also not really. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting. I could honestly sit through the entire 75 slides. <laughs> um, but it was really cool. So thank you very much. And hopefully I look forward to maybe seeing you in the fall. Yes, I hope so. Thank you for speaking all up, Autumn. And it's really sure. nice to meet you and, and definitely come by and let's let's have a chat and let's talk more about, about these animals or whatever yeah. it is you're curious about. I'd love to see all of your, you know, the specimens and stuff that you guys have in the yeah. lab. It's, that's always such a fascinating thing. So. Terrific. And, and don't feel bad. I took his class and most of the time I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Sam. Okay. <laughs> Cool, cool. Great. Good to, good to meet you, Autumn. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks, Autumn. All right. Bye. Thank right. you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everyone.